welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Patrick McChrystal, author of Who is at the Center of Your Marriage, The Pill or Jesus Christ? Contraception's Disintegrating Effect on Marital Harmony. Welcome, Patrick, I'm, to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm delighted to be here. It's great to have you here. Uh, quite a long title, What's at the Center of Your Marriage? One of the things that struck me of this, Patrick, people will hear, obviously, that you have an Irish accent. That's right. Okay. And uh, also that the title uses the word center, C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. That's right. That's a slightly different spelling. That's and that's right. because? Because we spell center differently in Ireland than you mm -hmm. do in the United States. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And now this particular book has an interesting story because of your own personal background. I mean, this book really came out of your own personal story, right? Yes, that's right. Um, I'm a pharmacist, Doug. I trained as a pharmacist and qualified in Belfast in 1987. I worked as a pharmacist for about six or seven years around Ireland, both north and south. And during that time, I never dispensed the so-called morning after pill okay. because it's the most abortive drug on the market. And I always asked my employers that this was one drug that I didn't want to dispense. And I got away with that for about mm -hmm. six or seven years until, until I took a, up a, a job in a small pharmacy outside Belfast mm -hmm. where for the first time I was required to dispense the so-called morning after pill. And I knew this threw me into a real dilemma and I, needed to, I knew I needed to make up my mind one way or the other. But even more profoundly significant, I knew I needed to make up my mind about all the contraceptive pills I and see. drugs because from my pharmacist training, I knew that they all had an intrinsic abortive backup mechanism, mm -hmm. which most women don't realize when they're using when the you use that, When you use that term abortifacient, what do we mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that the uh, contraceptive pill acts in such a way that in s a certain percentage of cases, the new, li new, new life is conceived mm -hmm. in the mother's uh, womb reproductive system, uh, fallopian tubes, and is then not allowed to implant in the inner lining of the mother womb, mother's womb and then is forced to, to expire and pass out in the next menstrual flow and therefore the baby's lost and right. in that sense uh, th that's what I so mean. So it's by not the idea of pre uh, preventing conception, this is something that happens yes. after. in a certain percentage of cases um, the, it, it happens after, after. So in a sense the morning after pill made you rethink all of it? It did. But I knew that I, I, I had dispensed the everyday contraceptive pill for six or seven years. I didn't want to think too much about it. Mm -hmm. But really, when this issue came to the fore, I knew I needed to make up my mind on all the contraceptive pills. Well, products. two things. One thing I did notice, and you mentioned uh, about Belfast, which is obviously in Northern Ireland, and obviously here in the States we think of there's Ireland, which is ca basically Catholic, and in Northern Ireland, which usually is, is Protestant. And uh, did that have an impact on the perspective of the people on contraception at all, or was that passe by then? Well, it was interesting. At that time, when I gave up the, the, uh, the dispensing of the contraceptive drugs, I was unemployed as a result for three years. And I went for uh, many interviews, 30 interviews. And during that time, I, I, and I, I felt it was only right to tell my future employers why I was seeking a job. Mm -hmm. And basically, nobody wanted to employ me. And I found that uh, pharmacists, even in the Ireland, even in the so-called Re Catholic Republic right. of Ireland, were really quite um, antagonistic mm -hmm. to my view. And that, that, even that was 12, and, 13 years ago. And why do you think ago. they were antagonistic? Were they guilty? Well, I went to see an, a number of pharmacists over the years. And the, the most frequent uh, a, a reason that they used to justify why they could continue dispensing these drugs is they went and talked to their parish priest and their parish priest said follow your conscience ah. and I realized that our parish priests and the priests of our country need a lot of prayer mm -hmm. because they carry a lot, a lot of responsibility right. for the welfare of the souls in, under their right. care. Right. Um, but John Paul II told us, and uh, told Catholic Italian pharmacists in 1993, in an address, he said, one cannot accept being party to a tax on life or on procreation. Right. That caused quite a stir in the pharmacy profession, right. but those were his words. Right. Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we hear about conscience all the time. We, we, there's this prefix about a properly formed conscience, which is supposed to be based upon certainly the teachings of the church. Uh, as opposed to what I personally have decided is okay uh, because people's conscience can allow them to do a lot of terrible things if they, in the sense that they decide, well, I think it's okay to do this. Now, I notice this work is dedicated to my hero of the third millennium. You just mentioned Pope John Paul II, the great defender of the family. 
and to your wife. Yes. Teresa. Therese, yes. Therese. Yes, Therese is my wife of uh, nine years. Okay. We have five children uh, here and there, four in heaven. We have four miscarriages, so oh, we're wow. parents of nine. Okay. Um, and during, uh, she writes the preface of the book, and uh, to me she represents the, the beauty of a woman open to life and open to love. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, at the time of making my decision, mm -hmm. I believed God gave me a, a verse of scripture from the book of Deuteronomy, and that scripture was, see, I sat before you life or death, right. blessing or curse. Choose life that you and your descendants might live. Mm -hmm. And I knew that God was asking me in that time to choose for life. And somehow that was going to be connected to my future descendants. Mm -hmm. I, I made that choice and subsequently Therese was organizing what we call a Youth 2000 retreat. I oh, think okay, Youth 2000 sure. is available in America Father as well. Father Groeschel's order. Yes, it's connected to his order, that, yes. Right? And she that. was organizing that retreat and I was invited to speak at it as the unemployed pharmacist. Okay. And uh, that's how we met. And three years, mm -hmm. four years later, we married and mm -hmm. uh, the rest is history. Right, well, and the connection there as well is because you were on Father Benedict's show. Yes, back, that's right. Uh, a few months back. Now, also, you talk about, in a sense, kind of like this uh, precursor to where you ended up and, and writing this book in your life. You talk about, in your own story in the very beginning, and the ideal of marriage, but you talk about the fact that you were in New York at the United Nations. Yes. And uh, you kind of <coughs> heard your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, your sons will be as branches around your table, so the man who fears the Lord is blessed. That's right. We were invited by a gentleman called Austin Ruse, oh, sure. okay. who works for CFAM, mm -hmm. and he sent an email. Good friend of the network. Oh, right. sure. Right. He sure. sent an email around the entire pro-life world saying, we need you at this radical feminist conference. It was a Beijing Plus Five conference, okay. and we need you Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, we need you all there to offset this uh, as push against the family and against marriage by the, the radical agenda. And I took five people with me, uh, a, a team of six went from Ireland, and uh, Therese was one of that team. And we were mm -hmm. coming out of a meeting um, in New York, and as we were going up, we were going out of this room, and this, the verse of this uh, little song started mm -hmm. going through my head, right. your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, your sons will be as branches around your table. And I thought to myself, surely that can't relate to her. Mm -hmm. uh, my future wife, children with her. And deep down in my heart, I felt that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And But already God was speaking to me about my future children mm -hmm. uh, for the second time. And that's why I relate that and story. And why do you think, because you say, was, was this experience in New York a prompting from God? Was it in your mind and why do you think you needed it? Well, I think what it did was it focused my attention on this particular young woman. Mm -hmm. And that was the experience I have had. I was praying for some years about who my future spouse would be if I was ever going to get married and I felt that at least it alerted me to here's a possibility because I dated some very nice Catholic girls over the years right. and for various reasons they, they didn't work out right. and then here then I was getting a prompt and as it right. turned out uh, we started dating a month later and we were married within nine months from, from, from that time. Now, was she your wife at the time that you decided to stop working at the pharmacy? Or was she was, she yes. Was. Okay. Now, also at the, at the very beginning, you say, thank you to my father and mother for their irreplaceable role in my being the man I am today. Yes. Why were they so important to you? Well, my mom and dad, they are traditional Catholic Irish people. Mm -hmm. We said the rosary every night at her, in our home. Uh, without realizing it, they, they, they had no clear teaching on the, the husband being the head of the home and the wife being the heart of the home, but that's the way my home was. And so I grew up with a, an awe and a respect for my dad mm -hmm. and, 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 and a love for my mother, and I knew that that predisposed me to a good relationship with God, my father. And as I seek to follow him now as a man, a man of God, as, as a saint in the making, mm -hmm. that I know that the, the model for that was laid firmly with my mom and dad, and it points to me the importance of a clear fatherhood role and a clear motherhood role to help the children coming afterwards play their part in the world in the years following. Well, in you dealing with this and speaking out about this, did you run into a lot of people who didn't have the same kind of positive childhood upbringing that you might have had? Well, not really. No, no at least not in the, in the writing okay. and the and you also think it's interesting that if the, if the parents 
relationship is so important yeah. that here you have contraception. That's right. And in a sense, people denying yes. their parenthood. Yes. I, f I do believe contraception is one of the most potent ideological tools that those who are seeking to destroy the Catholic family mm -hmm. are using to dismantle that institution. Because from my own limited experience, I know mm -hmm. the blessing and the benefit of a strong Catholic marriage bequeaths on the children that come into it. Mm -hmm. And so those who would want to destroy that, clearly I can see, even from my own limited experience, why they would want to dismantle the family. Why do they want to dismantle the family? What, what is their goal? Um, Ultimately, I think it's ultimately the ultimate, when it's all stripped away, it's a battle between the forces of evil okay. and the forces of good. The, uh, the, the ultimately, Satan and the Lord Almighty. Right. And both armies, both, both commanders have armies at their, in their control, diametrically oppose the culture of life and the culture of death. Yeah. The, the, the heartening thing for me is, I, I know in my heart that in the end, Jesus Christ has the victory. Right. And his kingdom is set for victory. And indeed, John Paul II, in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae, said that we have the absolute certitude that in God's plan, life will be victorious. Yeah. So we know the end point of the, of, of the, of the plan. Mm -hmm. So we, we, let's work from this point onwards. We know we may lose some battles, but we're going to win right. the war. Well, do you ever get the feeling that sometimes people are somewhat complacent because they say, well, we all, we all know how it's going to turn out and it's going to be victorious, so what are we worried about? No, I think that we, each one of us, have a duty and a responsibility before God to use the talents that he's bequeathed because we're going to have to give account of what we, how we have mm -hmm. used our talents on the last day. And I want to be right. sure that, Lord, I have used the gifts you have given right. me to the best of my ability mm -hmm. because either by my act or by omission, the salvation of another soul may rest. And I don't want right. to be found guilty to have been, uh, uh, by omission, of right. someone been able to n help someone when I didn't. Right, the parable of talents. That's right. right. And exactly. this book is mm -hmm. one contribution of my own personal walk in the service of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, that if this book can help save even one marriage somewhere in the world, then it, it has been right. worth it all. Right. Well, Father talks about in the foreword here about the fact that uh, Patrick asked the question, do you want a marriage that you know will hold together as long as you live? And goes on to say, maintaining a faithful and fruitful marriage is extremely difficult in the world today, and God's graces are absolutely essential if a marriage is to last. Yes. Um, John Paul II actually told us that a contraceptive act ceases to be an act of love. Mm -hmm. It's no longer an act of love, and there's a whole set of reasons for that. Right. But when a married couple introduce contraception into their marriage situation, they are, in, are importing into their marriage one of the most potent disintegrating effects on marital harmony possible. Right. We're, we're being duped by the world to thinking that we need to have less children to have a stronger marriage, that more children or big families would be such a strain on us financially and emotionally right. and every other way that we just can't cope. Therefore, we need to do it in a controllable amount and we're, we're stronger and the children be better off, but there's a, an, a, a lie operating mm -hmm. there because God has called us to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, not to have the 2.1 children that just sort of breaks even. If and, we're lucky. And, and we, if we're lucky and we hold, our, <laughs> we hold the line. Because uh, the church teaches us that children are the crowning glory of marriage and they're the most it's supreme blessing. So um, the, the, the contraception, and again, I can, if you wish, I can tell, uh, share with you mm -hmm. the way I see why it's opposed to God's law. Mm -hmm. But when we start stepping outside the Creator's plan for any area of our lives, not right. just marriage, we're getting ourselves into disorder, chaos, unhappiness, yeah. heartbreak, maybe even death ultimately, yeah. once we start st stirring off the Creator's plan. Well, as plan. you mentioned, your, your wife, Therese, uh, wrote the preface. She said, there is one comment that drives me mad. It is the common complaint just who does the church think it is to get into the bedroom of married couples and dictate what they should do regarding children, or words to that effect? Well, firstly, I, I offer the correction that the church never dictates she proposes. And secondly, she is not an it, she is a mother. That's right. Um, church has 2,000 years of wisdom and experience teaching 
us little mortal souls how to tread the path to eternal salvation mm -hmm. and uh, as an expert in the human condition and I think w w there's a temptation for us mere mortals in our short 80, 80 years if we're lucky mm -hmm. to come along and think well I sort of know better or I want to do it my way and we invariably find that things don't work out that well right. uh, so I, I think that the uh, Paul the sixth in his encyclical Humani Vitae mm -hmm. he, he said two things that the were that were very striking. He said, each and every act must be open to the transmission of life. Like each and every act that a married couple through the entire duration of their married lives together must be open to the transmission of life. And that's one of the hot tips, if you like, that I recount in my book, that if a couple wants a hot tip how to enhance yeah. their marriage, then each and every act, marital act yeah. must be open to the transmission of life. And I explain why that's the case in the book, to enhance the, and, right. and maximize the marital harmony. But the second point that Paul VI made in Humanae Vitae was, he said, we the church are not the, 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 the inventor of this marriage. We are merely the inter this, this uh, teaching. Mm -hmm. We are the interpreter. Where you know the church is the depositor of God's message and the proclaimer of it, it doesn't. It's, it hasn't dreamed it up as a good idea and starting to say you need to do it because we say it, folks. Mm -hmm. you no, know, the church is only the channel of the message, and that's the beauty of the Catholic Church. That when we uh, assent to obedience to the to the to the teachings of the magisterium, mm -hmm. we we're like child following the and they are and the leading of the of its mother or its father, uh, keeping it out of harm and ultimately uh, reaching. Our, our, our ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the introduction, there's a couple of good points. It says the book is not a counseling book. It does not outline a comprehensive 10-step program for a better, more intimate marriage. Why did you want to make that point? Because I wouldn't for the moment set myself up as being a marriage expert. Okay. What I've discovered is that if a, a couple wish to maximize their marital harmony, they absolutely have to avoid contraception. Mm -hmm. And the book outlines the reasons why. Now, that doesn't guarantee that if you don't use contraception, you're guaranteed to have a, a, a deliriously happy marriage. Right. No, indeed, you could ask my, my wife about that. <laughs> but what it does do is, you, if you don't use contraception, you are removing one of the major factors that will almost certainly cause a deterioration in your, in your, in your, your har mar marital relations and your harmony. And by removing that factor, you open yourself up to God's sacramental grace. You remain faithful to the vows that you made when you said, I do, at the altar. And God's grace flows. Ultimately, right. as you know, the sacraments are there as guideposts and, if you like, watering holes of grace mm -hmm. on the road to the end point. Right. And so we're, 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 when we use contraception, um, Casti Canubi tells us the ibex or obex, uh, we put a block, an obstacle wow. to receiving the sacramental grace available to us as married couples. And when we don't use that, those channels are opened. And Patrick, uh, in this book, obviously, you're mentioning a lot of uh, the writings of the church, etc. Yes. And obviously, you also... Uh, you come from Northern Ireland. I do. Uh, and you mentioned to my Protestant brothers and sisters, I thought this was interesting. What would Jesus Christ say about contraception? Yes. Is contraception part of God's plan for life, marriage, and family? Yes. Well, the, the scriptures, when you start the, going into the Bible uh, perspective on contraception, um, there's a, quite a strong modern Protestant movement now that's rejecting contraception. Really? Yes. Okay. And is saying that the Bible lays out a clear foundation for us to have large families. Children are the mm -hmm. fruit of the womb and blessed is the man whose quiver is, 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 is filled with the arrows that children are. The Genesis tells us to go forth and multiply and fill the earth. And um, the, the whole subject of contraception isn't explicitly mentioned in the scriptures, but it is certainly alluded to in the, the story in Genesis 38, the story of Onan and how God slew him because um, uh, of, of, of what he did in that mm -hmm. story. And also in the New Testament, St. Paul uses the word pharmakia. Mm -hmm. But some biblical st uh, scholars are interpreting as contraception stroke abortion in not allowing, using drugs or plants, not to either allow a conception to occur or to cause an abortion after an, a, a, a conception has occurred. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, a number of Protestant websites that, that are very interesting in outlining this concept. 
Now, also in here, you talk, you, you kind of list a survey. What group of women do you think had the following results in a poll and a, a dramatically low divorce rate, experienced happy marriages, were happier, raised a deeper level of communication in their marriage? Yes. And the one connection to all of the positive statements here is what? what that they all use natural family planning. Okay. Now, um, the thing about natural family planning is the way it works is it's not this outdated so-called rhythm method mm -hmm. that got the Catholic Church a bad name in this whole arena because, frankly, it, 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 it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, it's still used against, the, against church. the church. That's right. right. But right. the church doesn't advocate that. Things have moved on enormously now, and the newer modern scientific methods of natural family planning, natural birth mm -hmm. regulation, harnessing the cycles of the woman and being able to tell if the physiological symptoms that uh, t uh, indicate to a married couple when is the peak day of fertility and their monthly cycle, and then that they're able to uh, uh, abstain or proceed in whether according to whether they want to ha uh, open to having another child at this time in their marriage or not. But natural family planning has a certain number of days of abstinence mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle of the cycle at a time if a couple feels that they don't want to conceive at this time. And, co and particular the couples and particularly the husbands will tell you and I've recounted some of their stories in the book. Right, you've got some that couples. It's right. precisely the abstinence mm -hmm. during the cycles that enhances their love for one another. It's the fact that they can't actually proceed mm -hmm. and have to wait mm -hmm. stirs up that if you like, greater longing right. uh, and, 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 and care and love for one another. Right. But the beauty of it also, natural family planning, is it opens up that lines of communication in this most intimate area of their married lives. And that they're, if, and once they find they're able to talk about this most intimate area, they're able to talk about right. all the areas. And so the whole channels of communication open up. And therefore, you have a, you're, you're building stronger marriages. The ch it affects the, the, the parents whole uh, attitude to one another mm -hmm. but also to the children and the children can see mom and dad in harmony right. and it strengthens the family unit right. but uh, and children who know their mom and dad are contracepting end up invariably contracepting themselves because that's the only model that they've seen and right. it's okay for mom and dad to do it it's Watch okay it for be. me to do it well it's interesting too because you think about this whole self-donation aspect that that yes. our late great holy father talked about as well and there is a sacrificial aspect too to abstinence and abstaining uh, and so much of parenthood is really about sacrifice that's right and and so maybe in denying the opportunity to have these children people are missing out the opportunity to see to not be afraid of those kind of sacrificial love that comes from being a parent yes uh, the, you see the, uh, uh, the one other point associated with that is i've discovered from the research of writing the book that i was actually I wrongly, erroneously advocated natural family planning as the automatic Catholic alternative to contraception. And, but I've, what I've realized that the church teaches that natural family planning is actually only to be used in right. times of grave circumstances. Mm -hmm. As Scott Hahn would say, with a heavy heart, yeah. we have to recourse to this if at this time we feel we can't uh, have a child. But the whole ethos of marriage is, is as you've said, a total self -care. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the characteristics of marital love actually mirror, of, between husband and wife, actually mirror the marital love that Jesus has towards his church. Right. And, and they are free, total, human, faithful, and uh, fruitful. Right. Uh -huh. And that those five characteristics uh, are there, but that total self-giving, mm -hmm. that when a husband and wife enter into the intimacy of the marital act, their bodies are communicating to one another, I am giving my whole self to you, mm -hmm. and I am receiving the whole right. of yourself to me. And so there's that mutual total self-giving. So that when contraception is introduced in, that, that their bodies are going to still through the motions of total self-giving mm -hmm. but in fact there's serious reservation there they're holding back their mm -hmm. fertility from one another and John Paul too likens that to actually telling a lie to one another right. that the spouses in their bodies are lying to mm -hmm. one another uh, when they're using contraception well also I, I, we certainly don't want anything to come between us and our Lord either or we don't want our Lord to be holding back if that, that that's if, right if that's the image as well now you you kind of give a nuts and bolts approach which is uh, is really great because it really is easy for the average person to pick this up get a lot of basic information go through things like the history of contraception you got a quote here from Margaret Sanger birth control appeals 
to the advanced radical because it is calculated to undermine the authority of the Christian churches. I look forward to seeing humanity free someday of the tyranny of Christianity so yes. you can see how it's used. And also, as you, as you point out in the book, with uh, up until 1930, basically all uh, main right. line, if not all, Christians basically believe contraception was wrong. So That's this right. is not something... That's uh, right. That uh, has been around forever. No, Margaret Sanger was uh, deeply ideologically opposed to the te teachings of the Catholic Church and saw contraception as one of the ways that she could uh, ultimately bring about, uh, as far as she was concerned, or at least to attempt to bring down the teachings of the Catholic Church, which we know will never mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. But this underlines the ideology that's going on behind the pharmaceutical and the contraceptive promotion. Now, couples, when they're using contraception, don't actually realize that they're pawns in a bigger picture uh, where the pharmaceutical companies are set to make massive profits, yeah. but also that they're ideological pawns, uh, pawns in this whole um, area of the destruction of the family, the destruction of the human race, and ultimately right. the obliteration of the image and likeness of God on the earth. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for the fine work and the fine book. Thank Keep you, it up. Joe. Thank you. And it's available through HLI at their website. Patrick McChrystal, author of Who's at the Center of Your Marriage, The Pill or Jesus Christ? Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.